Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, can you see clearly? Can we see? Yes, Professor. Okay. Yes, Professor. Great. Let me see. Okay, so let's uh, just review what we discussed. I think uh, last time we finished the uh, divide and conquer. So we look at lots of uh, examples. And in particular, I expand the uh, things a little bit, uh, including searching. Because in lots of searching problems involve like divide, I call divide and eliminate. So you divide the space and you eliminate the space. So we look at the two interesting example. One is about uh, to searching a diamond, right? Uh, but you don't know the location of a diamond, left or right. So you come up with this uh, geometry sequence so that by the time you search, find the diamond, uh, the worst case uh, uh, scenario is a constant bound to the original distance. So this is a, a very useful technique um, in terms of searching. Like you, you expand the searching distance, right? like a double the distance until you find it. And another approach we discuss, it's a different than the traditional like a binary search because when you learn data structures and algorithm, you tend to use a binary search. But binary search has one condition is that you assume that the list already sorted, like in a dictionary, right? When you search for a name, you usually go to the middle, then you look at the, the, the number or the name with a, uh, is a appear before or after. So you can delete half of the space. That means that each search, you can reduce half of the space. That's why it's called binary search. But it turned out uh, for the case, many real life example, like the steamer fish, the quality you don't really know. So the optimal value can be represented by a quadratic function. Really mean there's one peak or one bottom. Is it maximum or minimum? It depends on the problem. So like uh, steaming a fish is, uh, there's only one maximum value, right? So usually you start with undercooked to overcook. So when it's undercooked, you increase the value a little bit in terms of time, the quality will increase. So that means the quality increase, once you reach a peak, then it goes down. But you do not really know where's the peak. So it turns out the best strategy is uh, if, it, if it's an integer, you follow the Fibonacci uh, number sequence. But if you look at all the real number, I mean, you don't really care about the precision. Right? Actually, you care about precision. But it's a real number, could be any in a real number. Then you use a golden ratio uh, 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 sample. Right? Golden ratio really means that if the, the length right, between undercook or overcook, so which is uh, 18 minus five, right? So you consider this lens as a unit, then the first sample should be 0, 6, 1, 8, right? which is golden ratio. So actually after the class, one student asked me how you prove that. Uh, I said that uh, for the continuous uh, space, which is use a golden ratio, it's relatively easy to prove. But for the discrete uh, situation like uh, Fibonacci number, it's a little bit more involved. So I didn't realize that, that there is a wiki site about golden section search. So I put it here. So that's why in my new slides, I add the gold, golden section search. So you just Google this word, the gold, uh, golden uh, section search. So you'll find the details. Um, but this is a very useful technique because as I mentioned, real life situation, like uh, how you determine the, the best uh, duration of your study period, right? So that's a, a typical quadratic function. So you, you want to use the minimum num number of tests to find out or tries to find out uh, your best time or duration. Okay, so this is a very interesting. Uh, so interesting in the sense that we use a Fibonacci number and golden ratio. 
since we're talking about Fibonacci number and golden ratio, I want to add a few more slides, which is really interesting. We all know that Fibonacci number is very important right, in mathematics. But also Fibonacci is very famous. We, we use some of, like a data structure you learn, Fibonacci heap, right? Although the, it's nothing to do with Fibonacci, but it's just named after Fibonacci. Okay, so I add a few more slides just uh, to, for the fun of it. Uh, you, you know Fibonacci number, which is a sequence uh, Fn equals Fn minus one plus Fn minus two. You start from zero, one. Then you have a sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, right? So you, you see this uh, list. So uh, what's the golden ratio? We already mentioned a lot. Remember last time when I do a uh, uh, like a demo, a piece of paper, rectangle, then you cut one uh, uh, a square out of it. Then what's the remaining part is, uh, is a small rectangle. And uh, it, this small rectangle resembles the, the original rectangle in terms of ratio. So what you can express is just like, uh, if a re original rectangle has uh, two sides, one side is A plus B, another side is B. So it means that the, the ratio, so this is the, the, the ratio and, uh, oh, so hard. So this is the original ratio. You take out the square, you get another ratio, and these two ratios should be the same. Then you turn out to be this is a 1.618. Or if it's reverse it, it's a 0 0.618. That's a golden ratio. So in lots of real life, like the music, human body, natures, many things. You follow this either Fibonacci number sequence or golden ratio. So one, one, one the interesting is this, uh, you look at the middle one, right? This is the rectangle I show you. So if you fold this corner to this corner, then you get a square, right? If you take out this square, then you get another small rectangle. Then we say this small rectangle resembles the original rectangle. So you can draw a nice curve is that if this corner is a, a like a, the origin, then you, how I cannot point that, yeah. So, so you draw a curve like this, right? Like a circle. So it's a quarter of a circle. Then you, you get this curve. And inside this, you, you this one, you repeat the same process. You can cut another uh, uh, square, right? Then to this square, you, in this corner, you draw another quarter of a circle to get another curve. Then you repeat the same process. So you can see that uh, it end up with a very nice uh, spiral. You see this one, the spiral. And in nature, like this shell, is exactly this shape. Right? And the more interesting, this uh, spiral goes go, go in, in to, to the center. And this center is called the eyes of a god. So this location actually can be uh, can be pinpointed by drawing two line, okay, straight line. So from this corner to this or, uh, this corner, original rectangle, you draw a line. Then remember this uh, small uh, rectangle, and you draw another line from this corner to the other corner. So the intersection is the location of I. Okay. So. So in nature, there are lots of uh, shape looks like this. In addition, there are lots of uh, plants, uh, number of petals uh, correspond to a Fibonacci number. So either like a five, a 13, 21, right? So this, uh, don't ask me why this follow, especially like some flower, the petals usually follow the Fibonacci number. Even the human body, for example, your, your fingers, right? So this is the bone of your fingers. You have a three section. The length for the, is one, two, and three, okay? And someone say your, uh, your ears, the shapes looks like a, uh, this a rectangle we just draw, okay? And so this is about uh, the human body and nature and your music. 
and you probably didn't know that this is a special notation for for like a base. So this is draw based on this Fibonacci sequence or this spiral. And uh, this is amazing. We all know that the Western music uh, uh, follow these notes, right? Or C, D, E, F, G, A, B. So this is one sequence, right? So then you repeat. So if you if you know piano, so piano this is uh, this is a, a white key. So there are eight white keys, and uh, in in this whole section there is a, a black key. It's like a sharp. So they have exactly five. You notice that five. As a group of two and three, you see that this is a group of two and this group of three. So you have a five black key. So all this is a perfect one octave. So one octave, two black keys, three black key. Uh, total is five black keys. Then eight white key together is 13 keys. So all this is a perfect Fibonacci number. Okay. So this is a Western music based on, you can say it's a Fibonacci sequence. Oh, there are more, I'm not going to say too much about that. But I want to give you something really fun. So one thing that, oh, actually, I, the only thing that I, I, I just I add is today, so I didn't have a chance to put on the website. So if you want, you can take a picture. To think about this, then you can give me an answer after the break. So you can do some kind of a puzzle. Right, so what's, what kind of puzzle? So you take a picture so you can think about this one. So if we take a Fibonacci number 21, right? So this is 21, are you agree 21? So you have, a, you have a small grid. So it's a, it's a square. So you have a 21 on one line and column 21. So, so it's 21 times 21, right? So exactly 21 times, 21 square of a grid. Then you partition this uh, 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 square in this way. So on this side, you put, uh, this is 13. See, this is a Fibonacci number, right? 21, 13, right? So if it's, this is 13, then the other one must be eight. See, this one's an eight and this 13. And in, in here, you draw a line, horizontal line, you cut it, right? So you cut, the, cut like this. Then you draw another line from this corner to another corner. So this portion we call A and this portion called B. And in here we do the same thing. Uh, this one uh, is uh, 13 and the other one is eight. Okay. And uh, here in this point, this line, this is 13 and this is eight. Then uh, you draw another line from this location to this location, you partition. They partition C and D, right? C and D. So we know that C and D is perfect, means that they are the same, exactly the same, right? A and B are the same also. Then you arrange this A, B, C, D in this format. You see that? This is another format. Uh, look at this one. This is C. Another one is a D, right? C and D is the same. Then you put the A here, A and B. Okay, so the total length for this one is 12 plus 13. This becomes rectangle. So what's this one? It's also 13, right? So 21 plus 13 is uh, 34. And this one is 13. So it's uh, 20, uh, 34 times 13. So I didn't do any magic, right? So I didn't cut any corner, anything. I just rearranged this uh, square to a rectangle. It turned out these two should be the same, but in reality it's not. The mathematics doesn't add up. You multiply this to end with one. This you multiply end with two. How can you get two, one extra, right? one extra? So can anyone give me the answer? But if you learn this one, imagine you can do this trick, right? So mean that in future, if you, if you, if you're a bakery store, you, you buy, you, you prepare a big cake, 21 by 21, and you sell, sell this small piece, right? To sell small pieces. So if you're cutting a different way, so you can get one extra, right? So you get a little bit more money. 
So this is a very interesting uh, Fibonacci puzzle. By the way, something to do by, uh, with the angles, like that the angles do not match perfectly, but that there's like a small discrepancy. Where's the angle? But we, what? Yeah. yeah, but which, which part of angle? It looks like a perfectly aligned, right? <laughs> well, you, you can try yourself. I mean, you're right in the sense it must be. Otherwise, so how come? But it looks like a perfect match. I'm I'm just uh, cut and paste doing this way, right? And you don't see. Um... Oh, basically, you're you're yeah. correct. Yeah, you actually in reality, it cut it cuts corner. Cut corner. Slopes is... are different. Yeah. What? Slopes are different in. Yeah, yeah, in... slightly I... different. But you you in your. Your eye cannot really see it. Yep. Yeah, it's so perfect. In fact, you can apply the same technique to any Fibonacci number. The more you have, right, the larger the number, it's more difficult to see it. So you understand that? So you just basically cut corner in those vertical, uh, horizontal, uh, this line. So this is not a really perfect uh, small uh, square. So we're talking about 400, over 400, you cut one. It's one out of 400, so it's very, very small. Right? So th this is really interesting. So, so that's why uh, Fibonacci is uh, so interesting. And uh, so I, I have, oh, so I, I don't know how to control this, this bar, which is kind of annoying. So, so I, I add here a famous quote by Gary O'Gary. It's a famous, uh, so he's like a famous scientist, know everything, mathematics, astronomy, everything. So he says that mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. So let me just tell you a one, one fun story about my personal experience. So actually the, the last century, end of last century, I wrote a paper. So about extended Fibonacci sequence. So let me extend the Fibonacci sequence. You know, Fibonacci sequence start with zero, one, two. So it's a one and two, so it's initiation. So what I change a little bit is that if I initiate from two and four, four and five, so which is two, two, K plus two, two, K plus one. So if you vary the K value, so you can have a different initial value, right? Does that make sense? So two, four, initial, four, five, another initial, six, uh, eight, 16, another one. Then so you repeat the same Fibonacci sequence number. You add this to get, get six, four plus six is 10, six plus 10 is 20, uh, 16 and 26 and so on. This one is a 12, 20, 32, 52 and so on. Then you get a bunch of uh, extended Fibonacci sequence by giving initial uh, Fibonacci seeds. I call Fibonacci seeds, the value, right? which is always two to K the next one is two to k plus one, to the power of k plus one, so it's double. Then I found that uh, all this number, all these number are different. But if I give you two sequence, I can prove that these are different. But for general, I, somehow I cannot prove at that time. So I have a conjecture say that all these numbers should be different, no matter what. You can go to any large number in this sequence. So after a few years, early this century, so one of the mathematicians from Milan solved it, Mass Department of uh, Technical University of Milan. And she is so happy and she applied the government grant, invite me to go to Milan for two weeks, just a vacation, two weeks. So I gave a talk. So one thing I did in Milan to visit the famous museum where you see this uh, Last Supper. Uh, you probably all know Da Vinci's Last Supper. In fact, I didn't know that before. I know this, this famous painting and there's an interesting story behind this. In fact, uh, this, this painting is almost destroyed by American during the bombing. So basically American bombed all the city, but the local people kind of smart. Uh, so they, before they know that the bomb is coming, so they put lots of sand Right, same bag. So at the end, 
all, everything destroyed, the church destroyed, except this wall. This wall because of sandbag. So that's why we have this treasure still left, right? So someone, if you, if you Google, you will find uh, they, someone put this uh, line, they put it this, uh, it's like a golden ratio uh, rectangles. So it says this kind of rectangle. Then when I visit uh, that, uh, I, I suddenly realized there is a Fibonacci number in there. Right? So what's a Fibonacci number? One is the Jesus is one. So what's two? Two you can imagine. So you have to use imagination. So two is a Jesus, the other one's disciple. So it's two. What's a three? So if you look at it, the Jesus disciples, uh, they are three as a group. Do you notice a three as a group? You see that it's, the picture is like a perfect. So three as a group. Then what's a five? So if you look, if you're adding the Jesus in the middle, so there are exactly five groups. Right? Although I did not find uh, eight, but I can imagine that uh, you see the whatever the it's a window or something on the two sides, right? So left and four, right and four. So you can imagine this is eight. And what's a 13? 13 is perfect because you have a 13 people in the picture. Right? I get so excited. So I talked to my host, who was a mathematician. I said, I found the Fibonacci number in Last Supper, but she never believed that. Okay, but anyway, it's, uh, but I, I always remember when I see this, ima I imagine the Fibonacci number in there. Okay, but someone said that uh, Da Vinci is really fond of this uh, golden ratio. So lots of her painting, his painting follow this golden ratio principles, it's including the human body. Okay, so this is just some kind of side story. Right? So let's, uh, oh, if you really want to know more, you can spend a year to find out all this Fibonacci related uh, fun. But towards the end of the class, I will give you an interesting problem. Right? Uh, in fact, we're related to Fibonacci number. It's one of the algorithm problem. It's not uh, the searching problem, it's another problem. Okay, so let's stop here. And uh, so that's a kind of like a review for, don't know how to exit now. Okay. So let's uh, uh, continue today about this new chapter. New chapter is about, I think we already start chapter six, dynamic programming. Uh, if you recall that uh, we already learned two techniques, uh, start from the simple ones, it's called greedy. Greedy uh, is kind of simple in the sense you build the solution incrementally. Okay. So you follow some kind of local criteria, then you follow certain sequence, you, you just do it. Usually it's like a linear sequence. You, you solve the sub-problem, local problem, then you advance. And hopefully this is the optimal. Right. And uh, so this is a greedy approach, which is the easiest way. And, and you apply this in your uh, everyday life situation, scenarios. Then another easy uh, technique is called divide and conquer. It's very intuitive. Is I give you a problem, you divide into partition or into sub problem. Usually it's a binary partition. Then you solve each sub problem independently. Then you combine solution to sub problem to form solution to original problem. So we look at the many example. You see for all this technique, you have to do exercise example. So the challenge for divide and conquer is combine in fact. So there is a, a, based on the complexity, you can have a very simple combination and sometimes uh, it's more involved. And in many cases, as we see uh, like inversion problem and uh, find, uh, looks like a totally new problem, but if you think carefully, this can be uh, reduced to a merge problem. Right? Then the complexity reduced to n log n. And uh, another more involved problem we discussed uh, is um, 
give a 2D plane and lots of points, you find the closest pair. Right? This again, use a divide and conquer. The problem is in the middle, right? Middle, so that means intersection between two parts. So you may find two points that even get closer. So how you take advantage of uh, known minimum distance between left part, right part, and can reduce the search space in the middle. Right? So we come up with some a very interesting solution. Right? So divide and conquer. So the more difficult thing is about how to combine divide and conquer. So dynamic programming is more involved. Instead of uh, breaking a problem or partition the problem, usually partition means that there's no, no overlap into some problem. Sometimes you have to break a problem into a series of overlapping or multiple sub problem in sequence. So I changed a little bit. Uh, in the book, it just emphasized overlapping. I also say the multiple sub problem. Sometimes you have to apply this multiple sub problem in certain sequence, not just once. And build up solution to a larger sub problem until the original problem solved. So dynamic pro programming is uh, very involved because uh, depends on the problem, uh, how to break up overlapping or multiple sub problem. That's based on your experience or based on case studies. So, so you can see that in terms of sequence, greedy, divide, conquer, dynamic programming. Dynamic, dynamic programming is, is the hardest. Okay, but still, once you know the solution, the programming part are very easy, right? Divide and conquer a recursive call, dynamic program a recursive call. But dynamic program recursive call, you have to be very careful because of overlapping. Because of overlapping, your efficiency may suffer. Right? So we'll look at the example because this example very much like a calculated Fibonacci sequence. You can do recursive call to calculate Fibonacci sequence, but it's not efficient because lots of redundant calculations. Okay. Let's look at uh, some example. So that's the key. So if you don't know anything, these two slides are most, especially these slides. So key thing is about identify a recurrence. So recurrence, just like a divide and conquer recurrence, divide to half, right, in recursive call. This also recursive call, but this recursive call is that uh, more involved. Usually the two technique really means that those recurse, you follow some kind of linear sequence. Uh, you have a, like whatever the position. So you look at a certain sequence, usually it's a linear sequence. So you follow the sequence and we look at a couple of examples. The more difficult one, is that sometimes you have to add a new variable. Basically, I call this a generalized original problem. So in mathematics or problem solving, you realize sometimes it's easier to solve a more general problem than the original problem. Right. So you already actually seen one example, like shortest pass. See Dijkstra's algorithm. The nice thing about Dijkstra algorithm, he basically changed the original finding shortest path between source to destination. His algorithms basically find the shortest path from source to all destination. During the process, you find the shortest path to a particular destination. So this is a good example showing that sometimes solving a more generalized problem is easier than the original problem. So that's one of the key point, not just in a dynamic programming, in many other problem solving, uh, situation. So obviously it's easy to say, then I show you example. Uh, later I will show you. The second important thing is that because when you divide the problem into a sequence or whatever uh, sub problem, overlapping means that there's a potential redundant calculations. So how can you avoid the redundancy? So this, there is a special, uh, technique. So good thing about this one, it's just kind of a, a tool already available. 
So there's not much trick you can, I mean, you need to learn. You just need to learn through so-called memorization. You introduce the array, you can just, uh, whenever you calculate a particular subproblem, you keep a record, that simple, right? So just like an array of entry, each entry is a memory of whatever the subproblem. So later, if another uh, partition call for a subproblem, so if you have a memory, then you don't need to recalculate, right? So that's the idea. And there is also a mature technique called removing recursion. I don't think right now people teach uh, how to systematically remove recursion. So in fact, there is a theory about how to remove recursion. But I just show you some example. It means a lots of recursive uh, solution can be changed to a regular iterative uh, process. Right. So we'll show some example. So this, uh, the second part is more like mature technique, how to avoid redundancy. The difficult part is uh, recurrence. Once you find the recurrence, you pop, solve the problem. Okay. So let me just give you the example. Probably you all know example, but I want to show you my personal experience about Tower of Hone. Han. Uh, you probably know that uh, Hanoi is uh, the city of, uh, of Binda, actually, being there, it's a really interesting city. Uh, so Tao Hanai is that's a picture. Right? So actually, this is from the book my daughter gave me as a Christmas gift. So I never know that uh, there is uh, a, a tower. So this is a tower. That's the national flag of Binda. But in reality, I read some history book. Uh, this one was actually the invented or this, whatever he come up as a, as a, as a French mathematician, Lucas. You know, Vietnam is a colony of France. But someone said that this problem originated from India. It's called Tower of uh, Brahma, Brahma. So I visit India a couple of times. I really like India's uh, temple, right? So I, I know that we have a couple of Indian students here. So I took a one photo from that. That's one of my favorite uh, temple in India. When I was in Bangalore and when I was in uh, Malaysia. So I see lots of temple, Hindu temple like that. Uh, so probably you all know, I don't need to, maybe I need to draw something on the board. Again, probably I need to, I want to show you my experience so you learn from my mistake, original mistake. Can you see it? Yeah. I need to put this. So this problem, everyone knows, but why I need to explain? can see, right? So you have a disk, a disk. So the large disk uh, is the bottom and this is small disk. So you need to move the disk from this post to this post, right? So this example of a three, right? So the rule is this one, once you place the disc, like a small disc, put it here, then you can, cannot put a large disc on top of a small disc. So that's only restriction. And when you move the disc, you only can move one at a time. So now the question is that suppose you have N disc, uh, how you systematically move disc from this side to that side? Okay, so, so remember, let me say it again. So the rule is this, Tower Hone is, you have a bunch of disc, originally small disc on top of large disc. And your goal is to move uh, 
all the disk from this side to that side. Still small disk on top of a large disk. But when you move, you can only move one at a time, one at a time. And that uh, uh, you cannot place a large disk on top of small disk. All right, so you can try all this, suppose you have N. So when I see this problem, an original problem, when I was uh, actually in China, uh, I was in uh, first, uh, I was just entered the middle school. So I saw this problem. I didn't know any recursion, right? So no programming technique background. So if I know this recur recursive solution, then I can probably solve very quickly. So but finally I come up with this after try so many times, then I come up something like this one. So imagine this is the last one. And uh, the, the last one. Somehow I kind of, uh, I mean, it's not the, the best solution. So I come up with, oh, you, you can just ignore the last one. And then uh, this is n minus one, right? n minus one. Somehow you can move this n, n minus one to this side. Right? So this is already recursive code, but at that time I did not know. Right? So once you move this n minus one to this side, then uh, you can move this, this one, last one to here. So this is one move. Right? So this is f n minus one. Oh, this is one move. So you put the, this one, the largest one to here. Then at that time, I did not know that you can play the rule of like a symmetric uh, solution. So I kind of silly and I have to move this n minus one back to here. This is just my personal experience, my mistake. So, so you, you see that. So you, you move this one back to here, right? You can move this one back. Then you move this one to here, the top one, uh, the, the largest disk to here, so another move. Finally, you move this one again back to here. So maybe you can tolerate this kind of uh, bad uh, algorithm, but for uh, a middle school student. So, so I came up with uh, this solution. So it's nothing wrong, right? So this is a recursive solution is fn of three times n f minus one plus two, right? So first n minus one move to here, and then you move this one, the last one to here, then you move back to here. The reason the mistake I made at that time, because I just focus on this, the, the, the starting place and the finishing place. Right? But in reality, you can do better. You can do better, right? So what's a better solution? So first so, going to second. Yeah, so part so and yeah, so 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 that that's one. The first you said this one, you go to to the second one. Right? Then you move this one directly to here. Then you move to this one. Then this is uh, reduced to 2fn minus 1 plus 1. Right? So it's the same way, because now you take advantage of middle, middle one. So you first temporarily move this one to here. But you probably slightly change because the, you, these two posts, they just like interchange the rules. So it's, because at that time, just focus on this source and destination, right? In this case, they're symmetric. So you first move n minus one disk to middle, then the, the largest is directly to, to that one. So it's one step. Then once you move that, then you, you treat this one as a source, then move to that. Then you can get this, this sequence. So you end up with n minus one or n to the power n, two to the n, two to n minus one, right? So we all know this one. Let's uh, make it more interesting. The problem probably you did not know. This problem is all solved, right? And then the, we will discuss these things. 
can we do better? Okay, so someone already showed this, you cannot do better. So what's the low bound? That's the low bound. And we achieve the low bound, that's the best one. In fact, the finding the low bound is not that simple. If I change the problem a little bit, just a little bit. For example, I add one more, one more in the middle. And this become like you have, a, you have a, a three or four location. This problem is still not solved. No one in the world solve it. So it means that what's the minimum number of a step to move those disks? I mean, there is an easy solution, right? Or maybe let me draw this again. At least it can save some, but this is obviously not the, the best solution. So at least you can appreciate uh, the difference. Why this one can easily so, so save lots of them? Because you, you don't need to, when you do a recursion, you don't have to move, uh, you can, in fact, uh, you can just move n minus two. Why is that? Right. Technically, you can, you can do that. The reason is that you can do, for example, this n minus two to move here, right? So it's f n minus two. Then you put this disk, second largest one to here, and largest one to this one. You see, right? So you add one and add another one. Then uh, you move, uh, you move uh, this one to here so, and another one. Then you can move the whole thing there. Then what's the complexity for that one? n minus two, or two times n minus two plus three, right? Is that correct? So you can see that this you already can save some, right? Let me repeat again. This you you this n n minus two as a one unit. So you first move to the middle one, then you put the the second largest disk to this this post, and move the largest one to the final location. Then one, the largest disk in that one, they put the second largest on top of it. Then the remaining one just repeat the function. They call another f n minus two and you solve it, right? So this is one solution. So you get f n equals two times f n minus two plus three. But this is not optimal. In fact, no one knows what's the optimal result. So you can see that the algorithm problem is very difficult. Just change it slightly and it's open problem. No one in the world can solve it. Okay, so, so I just want to show you. So why this is kind of interesting, exciting. This is not a divide and conquer problem. This is more like a dynamic programming problem in the sense that you, you partition, not already partition, you divide into sub problem and it depends on how you divide the sub problem. And in this case, you apply the, this, some problem twice. So that means you move this disk either n minus two, n minus one twice, right? So that means you have to follow certain sequence. So that's why it's more interesting. Okay, so now let's go back to our original slides in terms of sharing. So I think you'll get the idea. In fact, uh, there is, uh, I'm reading because of uh, this. So this, uh, the tower, the Indian tower. So there is uh, 64 disks. They call this end of the world. In fact, uh, it's amazing to calculate. If you can move one, one disk, one second, one second, spend one second moving one disk. Then by the time you finish uh, this uh, 64 disk, right? So it's almost, they calculate exactly like a four times of the history of the universe, right? So like a billions, billions of years. In fact, if you Google Tower of Abraham, uh, uh, there is a website, there is animation, shows that actually there is uh, this uh, six, uh, 64 disc, like a moving, jumping, based on this optimal algorithm. It just keep on the, moving right to the end of the world okay 
So you get this idea of how to solve a problem. Still, tau uh, hone uh, is, uh, is relatively easy, right? Because you just divide into one subproblem uh, applied multiple times. So in the following, we want to look at a close look of uh, some of the uh, interesting problems. So we will follow exactly the, the idea. So I will focus on this recurrence, how to identify recurrence. One is the follow natural sequence order. So there's some history you can look at, uh, but I'm not going to go through this detail. So in fact, uh, this one was uh, developed by a mathematician is a Bellman, probably your own know, like shortest path, Bellman for the algorithm. Bellman is the one. Uh, the reason that it's kind of strange because at that time there is some, no programming, right? There's no programming. There's no concept of programming. Just uh, like a five years after the first uh, computer was built in University of Pennsylvania. So he just come up this uh, name because uh, at that time, the Secretary of Defense is hostile to mathematical research. Anything mathematics, uh, he doesn't like it. So Bellman come up with this new concept called dynamic programming, right? Actually is involved in mathematics. So it's a meaning is a planning over time, okay? So you should know this history, why it's called dynamic programming. So this technique has been used in many, many fields. So as we'll see the examples, one of the famous example is a Bellman Ford for shortest pass routing, I will show you later. Slightly different than the Dijkstra's algorithm. We know for shortest pass, Dijkstra is a famous algorithm for using greedy. Here, you can also use the dynamic programming, right? the Bellman Ford algorithm. So let's start with the, the problem we briefly mentioned last time, interval schedule, right? So remember the, the interval schedule is a, a student has a many overlapping job to complete. So that student need to decide maximum number of job you can complete without the overlapping. So that means there's no, no overlapping. The goal is to maximize the number of tasks. But in reality, certain tasks is, is more important than the other tasks. So you introduce a concept of weight. Then when you introduce a concept of weight, the problem is more difficult. And you cannot use the greedy algorithm based on finishing time. Right? So it will fail. But still, the dynamic program we use follow a natural linear sequence. Okay. So, so that means that we still follow the finishing time, finishing time, the sequence. But we have to examine sequence carefully, right? Follow certain choice. So by binary choice really means that you're going from left to right, the finishing time, you decide whether you want the current, uh, the, the job, under consideration. So you have a binary choice means that you either select or not select, right? Is that clear? So you still, you examine the, the sequence from left to right following the finishing time. But the decision is more involved and you have to decide whether you include or not include. You have to look at the two scenarios. Right? So you look at the, you cannot make a decision right now then you just put in a expression, mathematical expression. What happens if you include? And what happens if you don't include? Okay. So let's just look at that example. So if you remember, you have a concept of compatible. That's a key thing. Two jobs are compatible if they do not overlap, right? So then you cannot uh, schedule two jobs that are not compatible. If, if they, if they don't have overlap, they're compatible. That means both can be selected. Okay. So let me just give you an intuition, which is uh, the most important. So you see for any algorithm, once you find the key things, then the rest is easy. Right? Remember objective find the maximum weight subset of mutual compatible jobs. So that's the key, not the number, but the weight. Let's just look at one simple example. Suppose, remember we still, exam this task from left to right based on finishing time. What's the first finishing time? B, C, A, E, 
D F G H, right? So suppose that you already make some kind of decision, you're, you're up to F, just say F. When you exam F, you need to decide, do you want to keep it or not to keep it? Right? So assume that you don't want to keep it. If you say that we don't want to keep it, wait, you don't want to keep it. Really means that, uh, so, so there is a concept of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you see at uh, the linear line, right? It means that it's a sub problem. The problem is means that from the beginning, which is the first finishing time job all the way to your current, which is F, your current position. So what's the best choices? Best choices. Suppose you're you're reaching F. We have two choice. If F is not selected, suppose the, the best solution, F is not selected, then, then the solution is easy because if F is not in the final selection anyway, then the, the best solution is you select from A to E, right? So so that means it's easy just from A to E. But what happens if uh, F is selected? If F is selected, D and E should not be included because they are not compatible with F. Then the, the best solution is whatever the weight of F you already included, plus whatever the, the best solution from A to C, okay? So you have a, a, in this way you do a kind, kind of recurs recursive call, recursion, recurrence. So I think we already discussed this, we can, we can skip this one. So let's uh, just uh, start with the algorithm again. So you first sort this algorithm based on finishing time, F1, F2, Fn. So you relabel this one, right? You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then you have a very natural linear sequence from one to eight. Then you do it that every program means that you start from first job, the second job, third one, fourth, gradually increase the length. Suppose you want to do the same argument from one to, to particular one to six, right, as I mentioned. Then the, what's the best uh, schedule? so that the way is maximum. Since you included the most recent one, which is six, then you decide whether six should be included or not included. If six is not included, then the best solution is equivalent to one to five, right? So it's already, it's a sub problem. Then if X is included, then you, then you have its weight, right? So your weight plus whatever the solution up to what? To two, because three, four, five, are not compatible with six, okay? So how do you know that when you select a particular element, which are the compatible one or incompatible one? So all you need to do is find out the index, the largest index that is uh, compatible with a particular task, right? So in this case, this P, very important, this P. PJ means the largest index index i less than j, such that the job i is compatible with j. So in other words, suppose you're for eight, right? Which one is the largest index still compatible with eight? That's a five, right, five. Really means that if, if a is selected, you should not consider six and seven. You should start with a five. All right, so that's the key thing. For seven, What's the most uh, largest index compatible with seven? Six is not in, uh, compatible, five is overlap, four have overlap. Three is the largest one, right? So that's why it's very important how you do this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, selection process, okay? So let me repeat this uh, selection process. Right? So maybe just through this uh, the algorithm directly. 
So optimal J really means the value of optimal solution to the problem consists of job one to J. So, so this is the idea of a linear sequence. So you see that you first, have, you, you first need to define a sequence in this problem. Sequence is based on finishing time, one, two to J. Then you find the optimal solution for each prefix, start with one, then one, two, then one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and so on. Suppose you already find the solution for all the one up to J, before J. Now we, we consider cases for J. So you can see that you advance this J one by one until this J reach N. Then for case one, optimal solution select J. Again, then we, based on our argument, right? Optimal solution either select J or not select J. So that's our binary selection. So let's just start with easy one. If this one does not select J, J is not included. Then the optimal solution for sequence one to J is equivalent to sequence from one to J minus one because J is not included. So the optimal solution is one to J minus one. So this is uh, described here. Optimal solution is this one. Remember this solution gave you a weight, right? Total weight. Then the second case is that what happens if I include J? Then don't forget, you need to collect a profit for VJ. Remember, if you select J it means there is a weight, right? Then we cannot use any incompatible job from J, PJ plus one, PJ plus two, all the way to J minus one, which, which this really means that it's very intuitive. Is that suppose you had eight, right? Suppose you select A, then seven you cannot be selected, six cannot be selected. So that's the meaning, right? So remember this PA, PA is a five, means the first latest index, largest index compatible with. So that means after five, six, seven should be removed. It should not be considered. Because there's no way, if you select a PJ, no way you can select, uh, or once you select the J, then no way you can select all these, these numbers. These are the ones that are not incompatible. Means it is in conflict. Right? So why does it say plus one and plus two? This plus one and plus two. Yeah. So remember this one is the location which is compatible one. Mm -hmm. So then the, the first incompatible one is a six, then seven. You see this one? Let me just, you see sometimes notation is not uh, really intuitive. See this eight, mm -hmm. which is the largest index compatible with eight? You tell me. Five. Yeah, five. So P eight is five. P a plus one, which is five plus one is a six. So that's the first one and the second one. Right? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so that's, this is just notation that to, to show you which one you should eliminate. These are the ones you should not include. Right? So in other words, all you need to do is just, this is the weight of uh, the one you select, PJ. Then you need to find the optimal solution from one to PJ, which is in that case, one to five. You get that? So it's a recursive call. You get that one? So, yeah. so this basically, if you select A, six, seven should not be selected, right? But you can still select from one to five, but you don't know which one is the best one. But this is a, a sub problem of original problem. So that's why we have another recursive call here. Is that correct? So this PJ is important. This just pinpoint the location for the largest index that's compatible with the J. So that's the optimal solution. It's very simple, just a recursive call. Then you just grow this J value, right? From one to, in, in fact, you can just plug in the whatever the number in. Then the, you, you recursive call, the key things that you, when you do a recursive call, recursion, the number getting smaller, is that right? So as the number getting smaller, once it reaches zero, then optimal one is a zero because it's just a bunch of recursive core. 
Any quiz discussion on this? Obviously, if I just discuss this, it's relatively easy to follow. The key thing is that if I give you a new problem, can you come up with this kind of solution? And you should learn the technique from that. So that's the idea is like you have a concept of a linear chain, right? Or linear sequence, which is one, two, three, two, in. But this linear sequence is based on the finishing time, not the starting time. Okay. Then uh, you look at uh, each subsequence, then you find out that the last element, whether you want to include or not include. This I call the binary decision. It's very important. It's called the, bi you see that? Follow natural linear sequence, a binary choice. So you have a binary choice, either include, not include. Then depends on the situation. If you include, then the, you should disable certain incompatible jobs. If you do not include this one, then the optimal solution is from one to J minus one. Right? So this is the, the final solution, right? Now let's uh, continue. Uh, don't forget that, that uh, that's not the end of it. I want to spend lots of time on the second issue. Uh, which is this one, avoid redundancy, right? Although it's not difficult, probably already learned from program technique, but I still want to mention that. So that's the, the pseudocode, which is basically, you can use any language to implement Java C. So you, you first give input, which is uh, start time, finish time, and wait. So you have n job, sorry. In job, in job, start time for one, start time for F, finish time F, then you have a wait, right? And the key thing is that we sort the job based on the finishing time. So you have a linear sequence one to N, right? Then you calculate the P1, P, ideally you just get, get all this PN. Actually just call PN, right? calculate this, uh, this one. So this is a computation. Computation is at the recursive call. If you calculate the PJ, right, you calculate the PJ or N. So it's, uh, it depends on whether you include, if it does not include this, it's a PJ minus one. Right? You remove that from one to J minus one. If you include that, you should put this weight. Then the, you put the, the index should be the largest index that is still compatible with uh, with J. In the previous example, if it was eight, then this one is a five. So let me recursive call this five. Okay, then the final result is you select the maximum of, uh, of these two. Remember, this is a recursive. Internally, you call again. So the structures look like a tree, right? So this actually is a very good example, show you everything. So you don't need to read the algorithm just uh, like this. Okay, for five, right? Five, you have two choice. If I don't select a five, then the optimal solution is from one to four, equivalent to one to four. That's why I call one to four, since I'm not including five. Or if I include a five, if I include a five, then the four cannot be selected. So don't forget, I need to add uh, whatever the value for five. And then, it, and then you also recalculate from one to three. So that's why you have a three here. You see that this three really means that you recursive call three, but don't forget to add uh, the weight of uh, five. And how about four, right? Four is like here. Four, you repeat the same thing, whether including, including four, not including four. If not including four, basically is you calculate from one to three. If including four, then three will be incompatible with four. The largest index is two, so that's why it's two. You can see that from this example, uh, every time recursive call, you move down one index, three, and the other one, you move down two index, right? But you can see this is a big waste. Why is a big waste? Because you calculate five, you calculate four, four, you recalculate three, and remember this three again, you recalculate. And when you do recursive call, there's no memory. So you waste a lot of uh, recalculation. 
right? So imagine this one just like a Fibonacci number. So I ask you to calculate Fibonacci number five. You know that Fibonacci number five equals Fibonacci number four plus Fibonacci number three. But to calculate Fibonacci number three, four, you need to calculate the Fibonacci three plus Fibonacci two. But you can see that lots of redundant calculation, right? So you can see how many occurrence of one. You have one, two, three, four, five, five, one. Redundant uh, four, five times or four times. You have how many copy of two, three, two, uh, two copy of three. So all redundant. So can we avoid this redundant calculation? Okay. So one way is a memorize. In the sense, very simple. As I say that for each value, recursive call, right from one, two, three, four. You have a memory. You put a one, or you define an array, one, each entry for one the calculation. Then once you first time calculate, you assign the value to that entry. Then before you do a recursive call, you first check the memory if it's empty or not empty. If it's not empty, it means that it's already calculated. You don't need to have a, another recursive call. You simply just use the value in the storage. So that's the idea. So this is the one memorization. It's a standard approach. You can still use the same recursive call. The only thing is you introduce an array, which is uh, is like a global array. You store the the result. So that's the only thing you need to add. Right? For i to one, you initial empty means that uh, you don't have any value. Then the once you find the value, then you will you will see what happened. Right? So when you do recursive call, that's important. We call PJ. So that's a key. When it's empty, if it's empty, I mean this is the first call. So you have to do this recursive call, right? That's the same as the original one. But if it's not empty, you don't call it. You simply return immediately. You get that? You see this this code and the, this code. What's the difference? This one doesn't matter what happened, it just always call. So that's why you have a lots of waste. You see this lots of waste. So with this thing, you have a memory. First time you recursive call, the second time, if it's not empty, it means that you already calculate. You don't waste time. So like in this scenario, let's just run the algorithm, right? Suppose you call five, recursive calls four and three. It's not avoidable because five initially is empty. Then once you have a five or four calculate, then you have a three, right? Three, suppose three, eventually you, you calculate it. This is faster than this one. So then the three value is already assigned. Then uh, you, you execute this branch. You find out the three already is not empty. Then you don't issue another three call. So that's the, that's the key. So as to which branch will execute first depends on how you schedule your recursive call. So that's a little bit more involved. Probably you learn all this in the programming or compiler, right? So that means recursive call, how you implement this recursive call. But you can see that with this memorization, you can remove uh, all the redundant calculations, right? So the reason I say this is standard is that you don't really to invent anything, you just copy this idea. So it's not difficult. Uh, another important thing that uh, you see the source of problem is this recursive call. Can we avoid all this recursive call? In fact, it's easy, you, do, you don't need that. Right? So you see this example, this is basically like a Fibonacci sequence. Uh, technically, you can calculate Fibonacci sequence by recursive call, right? But it's, it's kind of waste. You know that Fibonacci sequence can, can be easily done through a simple iteration, right? You get the zero, one already, one, uh, zero is one, zero, one is one. Then two should be zero plus one, then it's one. Three is uh, two plus one, so it's a three. Right? So you can just do an iterative process. You don't even need a recursive call. So that's the that's the, the implementation. Means that you you can just uh, 
get the iterative for a processor. Oh, where is that? No, that's the iterative process. Means that you 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 calculate the bottom up, not the top down. Top down is recursive. Bottom up, bottom up is just that you start from a small i from j, or j from one to n. Just imagine this is like a Fibonacci sequence calculation. Right? So from zero, one, then two, then get the three, then get the five, then get eight. So it's very simple. You don't need a recursive call. In fact, uh, there is a, a, a theory. Again, this is never discussed nowadays. It's called a tail recursion. Tail recursion means that a recursive call is at the end or at the end of the statement. It can very easily remove. Um, some recursive call is not easy to remove. Okay, so it needs some kind of uh, special technique. So just, it's very important. Not all recursive call can be easily removed to an iterative process. So recursive call, it's uh, very much like uh, probably you know, there is a famous paper by Dijkstra, right? That's why Dijkstra is like a number one person in computer science because he invents so many interesting things, right? So in addition to shortest pass, he had another letter called go to statement consider harmful. Probably you all have experience. Why sometimes use a go to statement? Especially for beginner, it's easy because go to statement is very intuitive, right? Suppose you are running to a situation, you want to jump to a particular location, go to statement. But if you overuse this kind of go to statement, then the code is becomes like so called spaghetti code. Spaghetti code means that it's e difficult to to uh, to comprehend. Suppose you write a pro a code for the second person to read, it's difficult to read. And it's also difficult to verify. It's not a modular or structure. So that's why he said that uh, go to, so before he, before 1968, lots of code is just using excessive go to statement right? because it's easy to program, but difficult to comprehend. So very much like uh, a recursion. Right? So why we use all the dynamic recursive solution because it's natural, it's very natural. Right, so like this example, it's a very natural solution. You just do this uh, recursive uh, call, right? By partition problem to subproblem. Okay, then the solution is just very straightforward. But when you implement it, it's not uh, efficient because of overlap situation. See, we don't have that problem in divide and conquer, but in dynamic program we have because it's this overlap. This overlap will cause redundant calculation like this case. A redundant calculation for three, redundant calculation for two, redundant calculation for one. Okay, so that's the trick. You know how to do memorization and you know how to remove uh, the recursive call altogether, at least for this example. Don't forget this uh, problem like resemble this go-to statement consider helpful. Same thing for recursive call. Uh, by the way, this one is uh, sometimes the animal program will give you the final uh, final value, right? But now the question is that uh, how you uh, you want to get uh, the solution. Solution really means that where, uh, the final solution, I know that the total weight, I know the total weight, but which uh, task you should select. So you probably need to write another simple algorithm for that, which is simple, right? Is that whenever you find that uh, the one that I select is better than not select. So that means you include the J, okay? Remember all this recursive call? So remember this recursive call? So each time you select the maximum one, right? Maximum one. So you, you only need to include the one where you select this one, which is J, and its utility, which is the value larger than the other one, not select. Then that's the time you should uh, record or print. Okay. So that's the one. So then you actually find out the solution. Because based on the recursive call, it also gave you a solution, but it just gave you the total weight, right? This is a total weight. 
does not tell you how you come up this total weight, which task should be selected. So you can do easily by comparing these two value. If this portion is larger than the not select, then the PJ is selected, you print. So usually this dynamic programming, you have to have a, another simple algorithm just to print out the, the solution, okay? This is called uh, doing some post processing, which is simple. Usually that's not the big deal. The difficult part is always is to find the recursion. Okay, any questions? Right, so basically we finished uh, one complete example. Complete example actually tells you lots of things, but it's just a starting, right? So we give one example means that uh, how you find a recurrence. That's a difficult part. Or through example called linear sequence. So after the break, we'll look at maybe three more example. And we know how to avoid redundancy through memorization, introduce an array. And in some cases you can remove the recursion altogether, like calculate the Fibonacci sequence. Although most of the uh, dynamic program solutions start with a recursion because it's more natural. But once you understand the, the solution, then you should optimize. Optimize means uh, use memory, remove recursion. Okay. So with this, uh, let's uh, take a break. I will come back at uh, seven o'clock.
Okay, so let's uh, continue. Uh, so we're going to follow this, uh, uh, look at some more example on the recurrence. Uh, we start with a weighted uh, uh, activity schedule, which follow a linear sequence, but uh, a binary choice. So in the next example, we're going to look, sorry, is a linear sequence, linear sequence, but not a binary choice. It's a multi-way of choice. The problem we're going to look at this one is called segmented least square problem. So again, the linear sequence in, in the sense is easy, but the choice is a multi-way choice. So this, I mean, in some sense, like a simple mathematics uh, problem. Uh, suppose uh, you have a uh, lots of data, right? You, want, you have a lots of data on the space, like a 2D space, X and Y. They're very close to each, to each other in terms of like a linear line. So the, the question is that how you find out uh, this, uh, the linear line, or how you, so that uh, you maximize the sum of the squared error. So this is a classic uh, least square problems, right? So let me repeat, you have a bunch of uh, uh, points that uh, quite close to each other, follow a line, then to how you find the straight line so that uh, you minimize the sum of the squared error. Square error means that uh, for each point, suppose you have this line, right? So the distance from a point to a line, so it's just, you, you find it's the closest distance. So you draw a line, which is, uh, from the angle of 90 degree. Right? So that's the distance. But you square the, the distance so that you don't have a positive or negative. So that's absolute. So you want to minimize, not just for each one, you want to minimize sum of all the errors. Error means the distance. So mathematically, you can just represent uh, this. So you need to define a line, you know line is, can be represented ax plus y, right? So y is a function of ax plus, plus b, ax plus b. So you need to find the coefficient a and b, such that yi, yi is the particular points, minus this, uh, uh, minus this means as a distance. So you do a square. So we, win, we want to minimize the SSE, okay? And uh, it turned out that uh, this is a classic mathematical problem and it's already solved. Okay, somehow I have a trouble to minimize it. Okay, yeah, at least I can minimize it. So this is just uh, some simple mathematical derivation means that how you calculate A and B from the given Y points, right? Given Y points. So this is the A value and B value. That's very straightforward. You can achieve it. But let's make it uh, probably a little more exciting. So in some cases that uh, a straight line may not be good in the sense that uh, as the more points are added, the error becomes too large. So one solution that you can use a multiple straight line to approximate, multiple to approximate, like this kind of distribution of data, right? So I'm, I know there are lots of students working on this AI and machine learning. So those are the like a classic uh, approach. They have lots of points, but uh, suppose you're in the work, your boss say that, uh, can you give me, how, how can I characterize those points using this straight line? Several straight line, right? 
But the goal is that uh, you, you need to balance two things. One is that uh, the error should be minimized, total error. And also you want to minimize the number of lines. The sm smaller number of lines, the better. So there's a trade-off. So the trade-off really means how you combine these two errors. One is the errors, uh, errors in the least squares. Another one is at the cost. Cost means you, you give a value of a cost. Then you, you do some kind of uh, a weighted cost so you can combine both and you, you achieve this optimal value. Okay. Uh, technically, you can use some more lines, right? More lines to be more precise. But as you introduce more lines, it's more involved and costs a little bit more. So that's why the, there is a principle called uh, balance between accuracy, which is fitness, goodness of a fit. And uh, another word is, uh, is uh, parsimony. Parsimony. So it means that the number of lines. Parsimony means that the, if you have uh, like uh, two solution for a same problem, you always find, you always want to use the simple one. So this is kind of important concepts uh, we'll explain later. So the trade-off function is this one. Again, you can have a different kind of trade-off function, but the trade-off function we use here is this. Remember least square error, we use E, that's error. And the number of line, number of line. So this is the cost, you give a cost C, right? Suppose say that uh, introduce a line, there's a cost. And this number of a line means a cost. C times number of line. So you want to minimize the whole things. You want to minimize this and you minimize this, right? So there is a trade-off between this, right? So you reduce number of line, then this error will increase. But if you, you use too many lines, this part is high, cost high, although this error is small. So what's the best uh, trade-off? So if you don't look carefully, or look, oh, this is a difficult problem. In turn, this, there is a very simple solution for that. Okay, this again, use the dynamic programming. Okay. Before we do that, uh, let's look at uh, the concept of uh, parsimony theory. Uh, so this is very important, not just for this class, but in general, if you do research, that's actually also, I always tell my students, like when the student present a paper or propose their solution, sometimes they use lots of mathematics, which is bad. You use, you suppose you use the simplest, simplest possible explanation. Right? So there's a, a, a concept called Occam's razor. It really means that the simplest of two competing theory is to be preferred. So then if you have two series, both are correct, you always prefer the one simple one. Right? So there's another words in the community called KISS principle. So it's like nice word kiss. Kiss means keep it simple, stupid. So you always should keep everything simple as much as possible. So the good theory should exhibit good quality and with good theory and that a good theory is beautiful in nature, natural. If a theory like a very, very complex, like when I, my student gave me some kind of very complex result, a very complex explanation, usually imply that uh, either the student doesn't understand or he or she does not find a good solution. So I would recommend you if you have a time to read the two papers. Reason that these two papers, nothing to do with uh, algorithm, but they are written so simple. There's no mathematics, but it's so beautiful, very profound. One is dextrous against dextrous. He wrote a paper less than two page called Self-Stabilizing System in Spite of Distributed Control. So he come up with uh, a really interesting uh, full tolerance solution, which is self-stabilized uh, self or self-fixed 
the solution whenever there is an error. And without any knowledge of error, without uh, central control, and can, the system itself can fix it. Sounds like a very noble goal. But so he come up this kind of theory. Only less than two pages. And uh, another paper is by the author of the book, John Kleinberg. He wrote a, a paper less than one page in Nature. You know that Nature is one of the most important uh, journal, scientific journal. Although most papers in the chemistry or biology, few papers relate to computer science. So this is one of the paper called Navigation in a Small World. We know that we live in a small world. It really means that every two persons are separated by six degree of separation. So you can just claim that the you and the President Biden are separated by six pops. Really mean that in between president and you, at most six people. Really means that if you know a friend, so that's the first hop, then friend's friend is another hop. So after six hop, you can reach uh, President Biden. So it means that the most the people can be connected in six hop or less. Okay. Now the question is, uh, how can you reach President Biden from you without knowing the knowledge? Right? So that's an interesting challenge. Or you can do the flooding, right? Flooding really means that you talk to your friends and friends' friends and friends' friends. Actually, I did some kind of uh, interesting surveys using social network. Actually, there's a, a Chinese software called QQ. So actually it's very difficult. The reason is that after you spread a couple of hops, it's just too many people. And your friend will ask you, are you really serious? You want me to answer some kind of question? Or is that a spam message? Then the student have to say, oh, this is assignment from a professor as part of my PhD study. But anyway, so Kleinberg come up some very nice properties so that the small world, if a network connection follows certain property, the navigation can be done without global knowledge, it means a routing. So you can see those two papers. The main purpose is to see how simple the papers are written without using excessive mathematics. Okay, so let's go back to the, to the point. It turned out to be a very simple solution. It's a multi-way choice. It's basically, we just need uh, 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 something like this. Uh, just two notations. One notation is the optimal one. Optimal, optimal J means that optimal points from one to J. So it's still a sequence, right? It's a linear sequence. So it's a linear sequence. Just like a weighted uh, scheduling problem from one to J. Now, now the question is that uh, should you just using, for example, a couple of sections that are like a straight line, or you don't use any straight line, you introduce any straight line. So what you need to do is just looking backward from J, right, PJ to PI, from PJ to PI, see, th this is the one. So this, this one means that uh, uh, you have uh, option, so, so this, uh, uh, let's say, you, e, e means an error, total sum of the square. So that means, suppose you have a line between i and j. So this is a minimum sum. Then uh, you, you need to compute this value. So th this value, you need to compare with, uh, for different j. Really means that for this section, for initially you want to calculate from one to J, right? But you want to see that whether it's be better to add a line, a one line from I to J, add a one line from I to J, one line from I to J. Obviously when you add one line, you will have, uh, uh, you will have uh, error, right? This error calculation, whatever from I to J the least square error, some of the squares error, plus the cost of a line, 
Then before I, then you just repeat the just recursive code. So let me repeat. Just say you need to find a point, the middle I. Right? So I. This is I. So for I and J, you have a one last segment, which is a one line. Then you add the cost of one line. And before that, you just do a recursive call, whether you add line or your I line. Just so you just need to see how long should be the last segment. So it's the key. To the last, I mean, last line is you should backtrack to which point I so that the total cost, this is total cost. Cost is error cost, right? This is the cost of errors plus the cost of the one last segment or line and plus then the, the rest part before I minus one is just a recursive call. And that's it. So since this I could have a all kind of position location, right? you could start from one all the way to J. Or oh, this J means if we, if it's the same, that means zero. So that's why if J is zero, it's zero. So that's a, it's a very simple. Let me just repeat. I think the best way is just describe it. You see, suppose you are here, J. This is a J location. So you just look at the last line segment, last line segment, right, to here, this is I, right, I. I could, any location, I could from here all the way to, to the beginning. Suppose I is here. So this is the last line segment. So what's the cost for, for this one? Is whatever the error, square error of this line you accumulate, plus the cost of one line, which is C, right? Line is C. That's the last section. How about before that? Before that, you say it's just a recursive call. You receive call I minus one, okay? Then you try the different type of location for I. So that means that the last section can include one, one point, two points, three points, all the way back to the first point. For all the situation, you find the minimum one. So that's the, the solution. So it turned out to be very simple. That's the solution. Obviously you have to be careful. Remember the redundancy. If you do this recursive call like this, it's a lot of waste, right? The same thing, lots of waste. Or you can do it uh, in an iterative way, like bottom up, okay? But let's first look at the, uh, uh, a way for that. Uh, so, so this is the the one, right? So you 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 first calculate the the segment cost for for different one i. So, so you can see this. Uh, so this uh, actually use uh, memory. Memory really means that the from J to from one to N, I is from J down to one. So you see how, how you control that? Because J could be from any location, right? J from one to N, N is the last one. And I, I is a before J. So that's why J down to one. Down to one really means subtract by one, all the way to one. So it's basically this, uh, uh, this one uh, uh, shows all the least square i to j. So that's the range for i to j. So, so basically is uh, i is a larger equal than one, but less than j. Actually j is uh, anything between one to n. Okay. Then you just do the, this kind of calculation, okay? Recursive call, do this calculation. And you can do the iterative way, it's, it's the same. So that's why you can see that if we're doing this way, running time is n to this cube. 
can be improved by 2n squared by pre calculate uh, various uh, statistics. Bottleneck cal calculate for n squared pair. n per pair using previous formula. So I'm not going to go through the, this detail. Right? So you can use memorization to, to recalculate. So it's, a, it's not uh, difficult. But this kind of recursive call is important because help you to understand that the solution, then you can optimize it. Any discussion? No discussion. So the key is you find out the, the points you want to select or to be covered by the last segment, right? Then you have a, or the choice. So that index is i, given this uh, j. Then j run from one to n, then this. So that you build a, a sub-problem, solution to sub-problem, eventually you find the solution for the, the original problem. Okay, so this is the, the end. But remember, the, it's very important. If you look at each one by one, probably it makes sense, but you try to summarize the idea in some sense, this problem is similar to the previous one. You have a concept of a, like a linear line, the sequence. So you're going from sequence from beginning to the end, right? So that's the idea. But the key thing is that when you examine the last element, like a previous case, your choice is binary choice. Is include or not include? But this one is a little bit more involved, but not too difficult because it involves a segment. Because the length of segment varies. That right? could be small, only one, one point or multiple point. So you look at all the possible segment lengths, then you do a recursive call, right? So in some sense, this is one technique called the, uh, just you follow the sequence, a linear sequence solution. So in some sense easy. Now let's lo look at one more, little bit more involved. It's a very famous knapsack problem. It uh, looks like a knapsack problem being discussed in almost all the, all the uh, algorithm class or data structure class. So this, I call this a generalized problem. It's actually is a generalization. Or the book says that adding a new variable, right? basically it's a, it's, a, it's a generalization. So let me explain what we mean generally. Let's first understand, uh, the problem. Uh, let's make uh, the problem a little bit more exciting. All right, a little bit more exciting really means I suppose uh, you are a thief. You try to rob um, a jewelry store, right? Diamond, right? So you enter diamond store and you want to pick up most precious diamonds, whatever, gold. Then you have a different object to pick, but you have one constraint. One constraint, you, you, you have only one bag. So you, you want to, you want to uh, make sure that you pick up the valuable things at the same time should not exceed the capacity of my bag. So that's the, uh, let's see the, wait, the capacity actually, let me see this. Uh, yeah, in, in this case, case, the capacity is weight, but you can be a volume is the same. But just say that, uh, yeah, th this is the, the, the weight. Or you can say that uh, if it's too heavy weight, I cannot carry, it cannot be uh, like a hundred kilograms. Right? And then the, for each item, you have a different value, a different weight. Right? See that? So item one, you have value one, the weight one. Right? Then item two, you have a value six, which is more variable, but weight a little bit higher too. And then the value, value 18, then the five. So it looks like it's an easy problem because the greedy solution you would do is just based on the ratio, right? Ratio really means that the value divided by weight. That's the optimal strategy. Right. 
but in reality, it's not because for each item, you have a kind of integer weight. And uh, suppose, uh, uh, suppose your capacity, oh, this may not be a good example. Oh, this is a good, good, good example. Let me see, five, two, one. Oh, I think what they do. Anyway, the, the key thing is that uh, since you have a different weight, you may not be added to the perfect situation, means is that the fit? Right. Sometimes overweight, underweight. But if uh, this weight or capacity can be uh, uh, like this gold stuff is uh, like a sand, sand means a very small uh, denomination or, or value. Then the problem is can be easily solved based on the ratio. You understand? Now the question is that uh, what's the best uh, the solution? I'll give you a capacity. Capacity means a weight capacity, and you fill the knapsack to maximize the total value. So let's see what what this example. So if you pick a three and four. In this case, we can divide the items, yeah? What? In, in that case, we can divide the items, yeah? yeah, yeah you no, know, you cannot divide item. If you can divide item, then it's an optimal solution. Ah, OK. Yeah, yeah. You, you see the point is that uh, if you pick this one, uh, you, you may not be able to fill out uh, the capacity. And uh, if you add one more, you will exceed the capacity. So that's the why you may not get the optimal solution. If you can cut the, the diamond into pieces to any size, then it's the optimal solution. So you get that one. You always pick the one with a- Yeah, this is ratio. a binary uh, uh, problem actually, yeah? Yeah, we yeah. choose item or not choose item. Yeah, yeah, that's one. So that's why I say if you can cut this into like a sand, then the uh, maximum ratio is the optimal solution. Yeah. Right? Okay. Because you can fit exactly and with the best ratio. So, so now the question is that uh, how can you solve it uh, uh, with this? Give you a uh, capacity. So that means this one definitely not the optimal solution. It may be close. It depends on the size of, uh, of your weight, right? granularity. Right? So what's the optimal solution? So this, it, this turned out to be a very hard problem. It turned out to be one of the hard problems that uh, means there's no polynomial solution. Okay. So, but we need to come up with uh, a solution called pseudo polynomial. So that's the new concept we're going to introduce. This is done by adding a new variable. Right. So let's see, probably we don't need to, to start this one. So the key thing is you make a problem more general. General really means that you try to solve a problem for different weight, for different weight. Different weight means that initially say that your bag can only pack 100, right? So what's the optimal solution? Now you should try to find a solution, optimal solution for any weight means for 99, 98, all kind of weight. So that's the key. See, you see that you want to find a maximum profit subset of item with a weight limit of W. This W could be anything. Obviously, including the one original request. Just like a Dijkstra algorithm, right? Shortest pass, you find the shortest path to a particular nation. I want to find shortest pass for all this nation. This one is the same. You find the best uh, profit, the maximum profit subset with a particular weight. I say, I want to find the maximum profit subset for any weights. So that's the key thing. As I say that uh, if you solve a general problem, you can solve problem, original problem. So that's why here you introduce another, so another variable called weight. Now weight becomes a variable, not a constant. Right? 
So in addition, you have items. This part is the same from one to I, right? So one from one to I. So for the same thing, you, you do the, uh, the, the same things really means that, oh, let me see. I, I'm not sure uh, about this uh, notation or with a way limit of W, yeah. Okay, and this is the item means a subset. Again, then you have a, like a follow a sequence, right? Sequence is the same idea. So you label this uh, uh, object one, two, three. So here it doesn't really matter what's the, the sequence order. In the previous case, we have a sequence order. Remember, one is based on the finishing time. And uh, for the least square problem is you follow the, the line from left to right. This one actually doesn't really matter. You just label each object one, two, three, right? Then the, your sequences follow from a subsequence, which I sometimes call prefix. And then you ask the same question, it's a binary choice, whether you want to select the item I or not. It's, it's the same, like go to, you, you go to jewelry store, you select whether you want to select this one or not to select this one. Okay. So if you do not select this item, then the optimal choice from one to I is equivalent to optimal choice from one to I minus one, right? That's the same thing like a, a weighted task game. But what's the weight limit? Weight limit is still W. Why is still W? Because I have not selected anything. Another say that if I select I, your weight, your new weight is different now because original weight is I, you should minus WI, right? The reason is that you already select that one. Your capacity will be reduced by WI, okay? Then the, the remaining part is still the same from I minus one is the same. But your value is different because you need to add your value, which is W or VI. You see that? So overall, this is the main algorithm turned out to be. It's a two dimension, right? So I and W. So you can imagine this is like a table. So I is from one, two, three, four. Then W, right? Also, it can be if it's integers, one, one, two, three, four, whatever the number. So the key is that uh, you compare this one. Uh, the last line is the important one. So what is VI? What's a VI? Oh, VI is the, the, the value. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me see. Is it WI or? No, 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 value, value. Value means that uh, oh, okay. on, well, what's the value? Uh, like it's a gold or, or silver, you see value. You want to maximize your value, right? Oh, okay. Let's see if you go to a store, you want to pick at the most expensive stuff, but the weight should not exceed the capacity. You understand that? Got it, that is the final yeah. value you have to. Yeah, yeah, you want to maximize your value, but subject to the constraint of a weight. Mm -hmm. Got it. But the solution for this one, you say that instead of finding solution for particular weight, I find solution for all the weights. So that's the, the solution idea, right? So, so this, this really means that uh, I've not selected this I, so the optimal solution becomes I minus one W. W doesn't change because I haven't selected anything. My backpack capacity is still the same. This really means that I selected the uh, I, so my value already increased. So the whatever the remaining value will be from one to I minus one. But my capacity, my weight is reduced to W minus WI. Is it correct? Because I select already one, which is weighted I. So my capacity will be reduced. So it's like a two dimension become two dimension. You introduce uh, a new variable, which basically generalize the problem for all the weights. Okay. Obviously there are two simple situations. One is that if I is a zero, that means obviously there's nothing, you're done. And another one, what happened that uh, if uh, your, remaining, your remaining weight is lower than the current weight of the item, or it's too heavy. So I'm not going to select. You don't have a choice. So you skip this item. Does that make sense? Right? 
So that's the okay. So that's the solution. So the the detail is is still the same. Okay. We just do it. It's a recursive call, but it's just a two dimension now. Professor, so our choice remains binary in this case also. Yeah, it's a binary choice. Okay. Binary choice really mean why? Why is a binary choice? Because you cannot cut the diamond into pieces, right? So you either select or not select. Because there were but three cases, right? The no binary case only two case. Oh, this this is not. No, this is not a three case. This is like uh, uh, reduced to the, the simple case, it means there's mm -hmm. nothing. This really means that if for your weight, your weight is less than the, the diamond's weight. Obviously, it cannot include. That ah, right. okay. Right? Got it. Yeah, I mean, whatever remaining capacity is, uh, uh, weight <laughs> capacity is lower than the, the diamond's weight, then obviously, I cannot select. So yeah, I that's, that's just up. a constraint, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. Good. So the key is introduce this W. W means for any weight limit. Mm -hmm. But because of this introducing this weight value, you make the algorithm not a polynomial. All right, so that's the another thing. Why is that? Right. Although this is quite simple, probably. I don't think we need to go through that because now you're filling the table, right? The table size is this is n, but you also multiply this w value because technically this w value could be very large. Is that true? Right? Because you never gave a limit on this w value. So that's why the complexity depends not on n, also depends on the w. Suppose, uh, so that means the comp how fast you run this algorithm, not only depends on n, depends on this value, your capacity. Suppose uh, your capacity is huge, then the table is huge, unfortunately, because you're solving the problem solution for all the possible weights, not just the given weight. You get that? Right? So it depends on the W value. Okay. So this is how we, how we solve the problem. I mean, you still follow this kind of uh, uh, like a sequence, like this order, but the, in addition, you introduce new variable. So this is actually the order solution space. Solution space means I give you, suppose you want to solve it for 11. So that's the solution. So I'm not going to go through this one. So one important thing is about runtime. Now the complexity is not based on the n, it's n times w. That's why we call this a pseudo polynomial. So it's not a polynomial in terms of input side, but based on also the by the w. Okay, but fortunately, this knapsack problem can be approximated to any precision, to a very, very small, means that uh, you may get a, a, a polynomial algorithm. This is, this is pseudo polynomial, means polynomial algorithm. Uh, although it's not optimal, but it's very close to optimal. So this is one of the important concepts later we will learn. Really, really means that for many complex problems, like MP complete, we cannot find a polynomial solution, but we can find the efficient approximation solution. Approximation with respect to the result, right? usually there's like you have a bound, a constant bound or log n bound being compared with optimal solution. What's the, the range? So we will dedicate at least one class to talk about approximation algorithm. But be careful, not all the MP complete problem can be approximated. So you cannot really tell, that's the sad news, I mean you cannot really tell by just looking whether the problem, both are very hard problem, 
for whether it can be approximate, the other one cannot be approximate. Okay, so at least I'll give you some heads up uh, for future, how we deal with those kind of hard problems. Okay, uh, let me see what time is it. Yeah, we, we, can, we can have a more, right? So let me add some more interesting problems. Also, I call this generalization. This is a problem from the MIT book. It's not in the current book, but it's very straightforward. Again, it's related to mathematics. Is you calculate a matrix multiplication. So as you know that a lots of uh, data analytics, including that's a famous all pair shortest pass algorithm, right? you can convert it into a, a matrix multiplication where the, each uh, graph can be represented like adjacency matrix, like a zero, one, like connected, not connected. Or you can study uh, network connectivity, like uh, from one node uh, reach a K-hop node, you are just doing a K times multiplication of a matrices, adjacency matrices. So matrix manipulation uh, is very important in data analytics. So one thing is common, common is a, a sequence of matrix multiplication. And uh, you may wonder why is matrix multiplication is, uh, is interesting. It turned out that it depends on the size of a matrix uh, multiplication, uh, the order matter. Right? Order matter means that give an example of a three matrices. One is a 10 by 100, the other one 100 by five, Third one is a five by 50. Okay, so that may have a different row and columns. So matrix multiplication, we know that uh, follow this association rule of property, meaning that you can calculate in any order and the results still the same. So that means one, two, three, you can first multiply one and two, then the result multiplies three. Or you can first multiply two and three, result multiply one, right? One multiplied the result of two and three. Although the result is the same, but in terms of um, computation, number multiplication, internal multiplication varies. Why is that? It's not uh, that difficult. Just look at this. Suppose you multiply A1 and A2, A1 and A2, which is 10 by 100 and 100 by, by five. So we know that matrix multiplication for each element is one row multiply one column, right? Internally you do, do this uh, multiplication is sub summation. So the total multiplication is equivalent to this uh, size index, 10 times 100 times five. So that's 10 times 100 times five. The result in the matrix size is 10 by five. Okay, that's the key. The result in the matrix is 10 by five. So the result you multiply the, this A3, which is five times, uh, 50, so equivalent to total number of matrix multiple is 10 times five times 50, right? So that's a straightforward. So the total is a 7,500. But if we do the two times, two times three first, that's totally different. So that's a hundred times five times 50. So, so that's the number, okay, not too big. But the result is bad means that uh, you get a, a large matrix, intermediate rate matrix of size 100 times 50. Then you multiply 10 times 100 times another matrix, 100 multiplied by 50. So equivalent 10 times 100 times 50. So it's 25,000. You see the big difference in terms of internal uh, multiplication. Now the question is that uh, give you a long list of uh, matrices. So you have uh, many way to put a parenthesis, right? So parenthesis means the order. So it's nested, it's nested one. I mean, you can have a uh, lots of uh, way to doing parenthesis. It's interesting uh, like that the way of different parent parentalizations is equivalent, it's a combinatorial problem. It's called the Catalan number, which grows uh, very fast. Is n to the power of four, which is, uh, is, is a large number. 
So that means that you exhaust all the possibility. You see that it's kind of expensive. So it's n to the power of four. If you want to look at all, you may, you may argue what we do is just try all the possibility, pick the minimum one. I mean, you can do that, but it's not the most efficient one. So what's the most efficient one? So that's the, the challenge. So let me just show you the one example. This is another way to do a parenthesis, right? If we have a four, so you can do three, four, then two, then one. Or in the middle, two, three, four, then one. Or one, two, three, four, two parallel, then combine. Or you can have a three, four, then with one, then four. Or one, two, then three, then four. You see how many different choices? So how you solve this uh, problem? The problem thing turned out to be very simple. Uh, if you introduce a, introduce a, uh, uh, I mean, extend, extend uh, the problem into a more general problem. Really means that instead of studying the solution for one to I, right? For one to N, for one to N, what's the way of Best put the parentheses. You said I want to find a solution for all i to j. I is smaller than j. So that means you have a sequence, long sequence. You look at any consecutive subsequence. You find the optimal solution for each subsequence. Then you can construct the solution, the long sequence from this uh, subsequence iteratively. So that's the idea. So the idea is that you want to find the optimal solution for any subsequence, consecutive subsequence, i to j. So that's the, the general problem. So the solution then turned out to be simple because for any subsequence, you just need to do a cut. Cut really means where you put your first parentheses. So this cut location could be K in the middle. Then once you have a cut, then it's like a partition, binary partition, right? So you find the left optimal solution, put the parentheses, and then you put the right, left and right, right? Then obviously after you do the calculation and you form one matrix, and the right also another matrix. Then you do two matrix multiplication, which is based on this index, PI minus one K and PJ. Assume that in general, the index, uh, where is that? Yeah, that's one. AI's index for this size is PI minus one multiply PJ. So let me just uh, explain this again. Basically you want to find a cut, the outmost, uh, the parentheses. Like for this case is what? It's one, do you see that? That's a one. For the second one is also one. For the third one is in the middle. Do you see that in the middle? So over the middle, they have not many choices. If you cut here, in here, there's also two more choices. So that's why it's a recursive. And uh, for this one is at the last cut, the cut at the four, do you see that? And this one also cut at the four. So, so by doing this, you do a kind of divide and conquer, but you solve a more general problem. You solve the optimal solution for all the ij. Once you have all the ij, then you can build up your solution gradually, bottom up. But it's a little bit more involved because it's not like clear bottom up. Because, uh, so what do you mean by the, a smaller subsequence? Small subsequence means that uh, the distance between i and j. So that's important. I mean the length, how long is each subsequence? So you can start with a length of one, then you have a length two, then you construct length three, you gradually build that. Right? So this is what I call this like a pyramid, bottom up. Right? So this, uh, this one is basically means that uh, it's a matrix A, A one to six. You see this one, one to six. 
this the last row really means that uh, from one to two, there were two to three, three to four, four to five, five. This is only one uh, length of one subsequence. Then you moving up is the length two. So really mean from two to four and so on, right? Three to four, three to five and so on. Then to the top is what? It's the last one, which is one to six, something like that. Do you understand this one? So you, you, you build so like a pyramid from bottom up. The bottom row is any subsequence, consecutive subsequence of length one. Then the second row is any subsequence, consecutive subsequence of length two. Then the for lens three and lens four, lens five, lens six. Then if you want to build any lens, you just call the, the optimal solution for a low level sequence, not necessarily adjacent, the low level. Depends on how you partition, right? How you partition. Just like this example, right? So this is example, this is already four, right? Four. You partition into one place means that you call for a level one. Another one is a three, lens three. So they mean level, level three. So you're at the level four, you need to call something level one, so level three. But each time you call, you call low level in terms of uh, length of each subsequence. So by doing this, then you construct the, the pyramid, eventually you find the optimal result. Is that simple? Very simple. Then, uh, like I mentioned last time, like the uh, weighted activity schedule, you, you probably need to build another small program to find out the location of each, uh, each uh, call, right? It means that uh, what's the location for this parenthesis, right? So this, you just build another points means that you're at the location. So eventually you not just only find out the final cost of uh, of uh, minimum cost for the matrix multiplication, but also at each level where you do the cut, right? Do the cut. So you cut at the one or two or three, then you go down then within each left or right, where's the optimal cut? So eventually you give it two result. This one gave you the total cost, this gave you the location of a parenthesis. Okay, any question on that? So, so the key thing is uh, this one, right? You build solution for all sub problem for ij. We arrange ij based on the, the length j minus i, right? And which is equals k, k from one, two, three, and all the way to n minus one. So you build a pyramid from level by level. And you, in fact, you can just do it a not recursive code then iterative bottom up to calculation. So this is another interesting example of I so-called, you generalize the problem. Instead of finding a particular solution for from one to n, you find the solution for all the i and j, any subsequence, just like the knapsack problem, you find solution for all the weight, not just for a particular weight. Okay, so this is a, a something beyond the, uh, finally, I would briefly discuss about uh, some, this is interesting, uh, it's not, it's in the book, but it's not in the, in the original sets of slides. I just mean, shown that it's uh, important uh, for many problems, you may have a different solution. Like a shortest path, you can use a greedy solution, Dijkstra. You can also use a dynamic program solution. Right? Both use the concept of so-called optimal substructure property, right? Right? Means that the optimal solution depends on the optimal solution for subproblem or substructure. So that means that the, the algorithm we use here, the dynamic can also is the same like a Dijkstra algorithm. What's a little different is that the Dijkstra algorithm cannot work when you have a negative edge. Negative edge. Uh, this, although in many real application, you always uh, have a positive edge, right? Positive edge, uh, just like a shortest path. Shortest path means like a route in the, in the traffic. So how come you have a negative one? But in reality, negative can occur in some more general application. Imagine like you're buying a stock, right? 
So you say, I buy a stock A and B, whatever, you follow something. Sometimes you may get lost or something, but your temporary loss is okay if you later, next step, you buy something which is more positive. So, I mean, just like a real life, you cannot really gain each step. Sometimes you may lose. Right? So this makes things more exciting, more exciting. So I want to show you some example why Dijkstra algorithm will fail if you have a negative one. Okay, so this is a good, good example. So if a source is here, uh, Dijkstra shortest path will pick up this one immediately because this is out of two possible way, this is the shorter, so this is, right? So this will never change. Once you decide it never change. But in reality, if you have a negative one, then the, you may go to the longer one and longer one and through this negative value, you get actually a negative one. Make sense, right? Even you, you don't have a, the final value is negative. You can, you can easily come up with some solutions. For example, this change to negative, uh, say, four. Right? This one change to two. So you still will get, uh, get some kind of counter example. So with negative one, it's more involved. You cannot use the extra algorithm. Uh, someone may propose that uh, what happened if I add, so key thing, I add a constant value, positive value to all the edges so that you can eliminate all the pod negative value, then apply the Dijkstra algorithm. Will it work? In fact, this is very similar to the problem I gave you last time when we talk about uh, spanning tree and shortest path one, right? Remember the example say that if a, a positive value you do a square, uh, it doesn't work for Dijkstra algorithm. Same reason here. Same reason here is that, uh, look at this example. Suppose you want to, you see that without uh, adding anything, S to T, what's the shortest path? It's three, this one, right? Three plus three minus three is three. This one is four. But if we, if we want to eliminate this one, you add the uh, three to each edge. Then this becomes four and four, this becomes uh, six and six. So then the, this will be the shorter pass. The reason is because the hop count are different in the tax struggles. So that means simply adding a positive number to eliminate negative number doesn't work. Okay. So there is a bare manifold algorithm. The idea is using some kind of special property, also introduce a variable called the hop count. We know that uh, for a, any shortest pass in a graph with n nodes, the longest pass is n minus one. So then it's easy. We can use the hop count as a restriction or it's like a recursion. So we introduce a variable called i means a hop count. It means a number of edges. So now the problem is like you, you want to find the shortest path to from this S to a destination using I edges. Then you can do it some kind of like a re recursion. Again, you can consider the situation is what happened if the uh, particular uh, edge is included or not included the same idea, right? So if not included, that means the hop count can be reduced by one. If it's included, included, it's, it's just bring the last hop, right? Then the you, you can find out the, the cost of this W. See, WB means that the cost of the edge then you do a some kind of a recursive call, but you limit to the number of uh, edges used. So this basic, if you think ever, is a Bellman Ford algorithm. Very really like uh, in reality, if you are if you ask your neighbor, right? This is how I explain I, uh, Bellman Ford algorithm. Ask your neighbor what's your shortest path to the destination. So 
your neighbor will tell you my estimate uh, shortest path is particular distance. Distance. So all you need to do is just his estimated distance plus the cost of the edge connecting you and me. So this is how we how we do it, right? So if you think carefully, this is the the one. Means that you want to you. This is your neighbor's, your neighbor's best estimate, plus the distance between you and your neighbor. This one is your current estimate. Then you pick the minimum of these two. You keep on updating. So this is like iterative process, but this one is more like based on the hop count. You can do a recursive call, but it's like a two dimensions. You start from the a node and the neighbor, and then the hop count, you limit the hop count. Start with n minus one. You get that? So I'm not going to go through detail, but again, this is a, this example just show that it's important sometimes uh, you have a multiple solution, although this case, uh, the Bellman forward algorithm uh, is more general, but doesn't mean it's more effective. But you can have a dynamic uh, solution for for shortest pass. The idea is simple is that for each node or each intermediate node or each node in the graph, ask your neighbor's shortest distance. They compare neighbor's shortest distance against my current estimate short, shortest distance. You keep the minimum of these two. Then you keep on iterating, eventually you will converge. Okay. So I think we are really run out of, uh, so the last example is also very interesting is that uh, you introduce another variable. Again, you make it more general to solve all pair shortest paths. And you may wondering like all pair shortest paths means that not like Dijkstra is one-to-one -one shortest paths. All pair means that for any nodes to any nodes, you find the shortest path. So that's quite all to all, all pair shortest path. A naive approach is that you can use a Dijkstra algorithm, right? You apply the uh, multiple times, but it's not that efficient. Actually, you have a more efficient way is that you find all the shortest paths between any two pair of nodes and using the complexity of n to the power uh, n cube. Again, you can use dynamic programming approach. The key here is that you introduce a new variable called the intermediate node set. Intermediate node set. Again, it's like a sequence of node set. You limit the intermediate node set, then uh, you can gradually expand it from one, two, three, all the way to n. Then you can solve the problem. Okay, so because of time limit, uh, let's stop here. By the way, after that, uh, so basically you learn all the kind of tricks of dynamic programming. So in the next class, we look at a couple of more application of dynamic programming, which is more exciting, related to bioinformatics or computational bio, uh, bio, uh, biology. It's like a string matching. So it's a very exciting uh, problem. But again, the challenge is, uh, is the same, is you find out uh, Recurrence. Once you find a recurrence, they can solve the problem. Right? So it's it's a very interesting problem. One is called the R in uh, R in uh, A uh, structure matching. Then another problem is a sequence alignment, like a DNA sequence alignment. So these are like a really practical, it's a hot topic right now. So see that uh, how can we solve this problem uh, using dynamic program? Okay. Uh, let's uh, stop here. Uh, any question before we stop? Oh, by the way, don't forget to submit your homework. The due date is tonight. I think initially I made a mistake, I put the 25, but in the homework uh, label, I put the deadline today. Right? Do you have any issues? Okay, if no, uh, I'll see you.